being in the presence of Beethoven's string quartets, you, you feel him swinging for the bleachers. You feel him writing for eternity. With our Beethoven cycle, the first in Philadelphia, we wanted to reach as broad an audience as possible. We performed our Beethoven cycle in eight concerts, five of which were in a more traditional format, and three of which we presented in an interdisciplinary context. Kelly Writer's House is a unique resource that we have on campus. It's a great hub of creativity and culture, and we knew that we wanted to work with them for this project. We had collaborated with them before a few years ago on a concert centered on the music of Bartok, and it just seemed like a natural connection to build on for this Beethoven cycle. It was part of the collaboration that I saw the quartet have that kind of moved me further than like actually just listening to it like over a recording. It was like all of that energy and like that play back and forth for this like old piece of music and bringing it back to life. It was very cool to put myself in the middle of that. This is what beauty sounds like divinely depressing, blue, blue, dark blue, and sometimes pink with pills. This is what the inside of a white man's mojo sounds like. Playing the first notes of Beethoven's Opus 132, immediately after hearing Yolanda Wisher's powerful poem, uh, changed the experience for me in ways that I never thought that it would. Uh, I don't imagine I'll ever play this piece again without feeling the resonance of the, the words that these four poets brought to the music. Is there a rain that does not threaten a flood? Is there a flood that does not promise an ocean? Our fingertips answer these raised goosebumps with hushing pressure. We stand, withering, nervous, around the blue-orange flame of the propane, waiting, waiting, waiting for our hurricane. The music of Beethoven, particularly the late quartets, had an enormous influence on many writers of poetry and prose. Aldous Huxley basically dedicated a whole chapter of his novel, Point Counterpoint, to the slow movement of the A minor quartet, Opus 132. And there's some evidence that T.S. Eliot, in writing his four quartets uh, towards the end of his life, had Beethoven's late quartets in mind. That's the thing about Philly, it's enormous. Often you're in public and there's no one to see you, or just one person, nothing to do but wave. But the wave is pitch, it's abrasion. It's the formal rub, and then the sequence of formal rubs. It's the poem making a sound. It's you between its music. Would you listen differently to the poem than to a sequence of wordless sounds? Try not to. I'm Davy Noodle, I'm a doctoral candidate in the English program, and I'm also a poet, and had the great pleasure of collaborating with the Ellis Quartet uh, in the fall in a performance at Kelly Writer's House. Writing a poem is a thing that, like, as in the same way that a piece of music does this, like, takes up time, and it's sort of like a way of taking up time. Mm -hmm. And so it was lovely to have a process of composing where I just, like, hung out with the piece and let it take up time such that I might, like, write a poem that took up time in dialogue with it.
most of my lectures, you know, have music or some sort of, you know, um, sound examples, you know, and it's usually from this sort of stock CD that I have. But actually being able to sort of have it live and have work with you all, and, you know, and these are these ideas that I have about how hearing works and how it works from a sort of neuroscience perspective, and then to be able to have you guys say, oh, well, Think about that not sort of in a neuroscience terms, but sort of in music terms, or how you think about music and how you think about how um, Beethoven wrote music and how other folks wrote music was really sort of was really just a great experience and learning experience for me. You know, just you know we had we had the same ideas, but we just sort of thought about them in using different words in different ways. It was one of the best sort of musical experiences I had, just being so being able to you know, sort of get into sort of what you guys were thinking about and why it was so important to you and, and how much work you all had put into creating this program and, and, you know, doing my little part, you know, for that, you know, my little blurb um, and then being able to go and sit in the audience and listen to the whole thing and then, you know, coming at other points through the year and hearing hearing, hearing the other, other um, pieces was, was just a great experience. You know, something that was, you know, really special and, you know, one of the sort of the great things about one of those sort of great faculty things you can do at a university. So for example, if in the quartet, if everyone's sort of playing the same notes at the same rhythm at the same time, there's really no way there um, you'd be able to tell one instrument from another instrument. You'll hear this rich, deep sound, but you're not going to be able to sort of um, separate one instrument from the other. But if the cello all of a sudden separates itself from um, the other instruments by playing, you know, some other rhythm, all of a sudden, because it's different, you'll be able to hear it and extract it. I thought, gosh, wouldn't it be great to write a play about a string quartet? Because I've always felt that the voices of characters in a play, when they're written well, feel like a musical interchange. And I always felt when playing chamber music that each instrument felt like a character in conversation with each other. It was uh, so rich, there was so much to it. It was the kind of project I just love to dive into and in exploring that really wonderful nexus of um, musical literature, literary music, uh, literary figures inspired by music. It's a play that is all about music and it's very musical and rhythmic and demanding in terms of overlapping dialogue and pauses and the interjection of music. In Opus, Michael Hollinger draws the audience into the world of string quartets and of human relationships, of people rehearsing, arguing, creating art, and trying to make a living at the same time. It's completely riveting to see a string quartet work in this play. For me, Sitting in the audience, hearing the Daedalus String Quartet playing Opus 131 immediately after hearing the play, I, I felt as though I, the air was somehow more highly oxygenated. When we performed Opus 131, there was this fantastic feeling of the audience not being on the other side of the room, but being playing the music right alongside us. And afterwards, people told us, you should have a staged reading before every performance. As a director, I was really educated about uh, not just the work of a string quartet, but the Daedalus string quartet. Uh, it, it's pretty um, extraordinary to be privileged to be in that room. Uh, and it was uh, very fun and interesting and enlightening to 
to watch that in action. I very much approached the play both as story making uh, and trying to figure out who are these characters and what are they pursuing, but also how many different musical textures that are present in the quartets can I replicate on stage. Both the ferocity of the music and the incredible um, fragility of the music were both really present in the performance. One of the things I was trying to get at in the play was to honor what I consider a noble and tragic feature of musicians and actors is that both professions are on some level sacrificing themselves. They're entering into a written work that might have been created by somebody who's been dead for a century or two. And to track their spiritual life through these markings on a page, to create a live experience that disappears immediately as they make it and goes away and has no trace except what it leaves in the hearts of its audiences. My name is Sunny and I major in math and minor in music at Penn. As a cellist, I've always been such a big fan of the Dayless Quartet and I was so excited when I learned about the complete Beethoven cycle that happened this year. And I was so fortunate that I was able to be at all the concerts and every performance was just so uh, special and unforgettable. One of my favorite moments was from the second movement of the Harp Quartet, or Opus 74. Uh, it was just so uplifting and uh, it was such a revelation to me. To play a Beethoven string quartet is to feel like you get to climb on Beethoven's back. And for me to hear the Daedalus string quartet play Beethoven's Opus 131 in conjunction with my play uh, feels like I get to dance with Beethoven a little bit too. Mm -hmm. 